Hello. Hey, Mara. Um, welcome to a, another Friday conversation with experts. Um, my name is Mara Kaufman, and I am the CEO and co-founder of Brain Trust. We are a platform where parents can connect with certified teachers and learning specialists for private tutoring. And today I am here with Elizabeth Dougherty, who is a speech language pathologist here in New York. Um, and we are going to be talking about what a speech language pathologist does and how um, speech and language impact a child's experience in the classroom and beyond. Um, but before we begin, I'll pass it over to Elizabeth to tell us a little bit about her background. Thanks. So yeah, thanks, Mara. I'm Elizabeth. I'm a speech language pathologist and I've been working here in New York City for the past 10 years. I've worked in public schools, private schools, charter schools. I've worked with through early intervention students, ages, children really, ages two and three, all the way up through high school and college age students. And right now I'm the owner of Manhattan Speech, Language and Literacy, where I support students with language based learning disabilities. And what exactly is it that a speech language pathologist does? What kind of, um, like, how do you support students? Sure. So we support students in two main areas of language, receptive language and expressive language. So we can think of receptive language as the input. What we're not only hearing, but also processing, understanding, and making sense of. So this is things like being able to follow a multi-step direction or being able to listen to a story read aloud and making sense of the message. The other component of language support is expressive language, which is the output, the ability to share your thoughts, ideas, and feelings clearly, coherently, and using the appropriate vocabulary terms. And so very clearly, you know, both of those things can have a huge impact on a child's existence in the world around him inside the classroom and outside of the classroom. Um, so thinking about that, what are some of the ways in which um, expressive and receptive language impact children in the classroom at sort of different stages of their development in elementary school and middle school and then you know, thinking if there's if those impacts then continue on through high school. Yes, they certainly can. So any type of language impairment is going to really impact you the moment you walk into the door in school. The teacher asks you to take off your coat, hang up your backpack, grab some hand sanitizer and sit at your desk. That's four step direction that you've got to process, understand and execute. So from the moment you walk into school to the moment that you leave, you're going to be using your language skills. In early elementary grades, you're getting a lot of auditory directions from the teacher. Your teacher is probably reading aloud a lot of stories to you. And so if you're having challenges with language, you may be missing some of those components. As you develop further into the school age years, the messages are, are only going to become more and more complex. Mm -hmm. So for middle school students, there are going to be more complex directions on perhaps how to uh, break down a math story problem. And in a high school, student may be getting directions on how to do a science lab experiment. If you're not able to process all of that information, you're gonna have a difficult time doing the work. Not because you aren't capable, but because the language component is getting in the way. The same is true for expressive language. From the moment you walk into the door at school, you wanna be able to tell your teacher everything you're thinking. You wanna be able to formulate a question to ask for clarification or support. And you're gonna to wanna to also be able to use words, vocabulary, examples from text to support your thinking. So whether you're talking about a picture book in pre-K or the Great Gatsby in 11th grade, you're going to be able, you're going to need to use a language efficiently to share what you've learned. Mm -hmm. And thinking about a lot of those examples, um, you know, there's both the language that students are hearing and that students have to use themselves, whether, um, it has to do with processing those words or expressing those words themselves in paper or verbally. But what about, um, do speech language pathologists also support kids who have dif difficulty with articulation and make, you know, actually getting the sounds out of their mouth or learning to do the reading of the words that they have to do because, you know, even before we're able to communicate our ideas or listen to the ideas that others communicate themselves, all of those words also break down into all of these individual sounds that also fall under the work of a speech language pathologist, right? Absolutely. And so thinking about those individual sounds, you know, hearing inside of a word, such as the word cat, there's that k and that a and that t 
sounds. We've got to be able to hear all three sounds and say all three sounds. In terms of the hearing, particularly in younger grades, we call this phonemic and phonological awareness. And this is something that a speech language pathologist would really be supporting in younger grades, as it is an essential skill for later literacy success. If you can't hear the sounds in a word, how can you sound out a word on the paper? Uh, but students who are older and struggle with reading may also need support in this area. And a speech language pathologist can provide that. Uh, in terms of the speech sound production, the articulation, there is a wide range of how speech therapists will support that. For many students, the errors are developmental and many students tend to grow out of things. You know, you may hear a lisp or an R sound distorted and that's really kind of typical of early childhood speech. We really associate that with what a child sounds like. But a speech language pathologist will be able to listen in and say, you know, are these errors typical? Is this something we would expect maybe a four-year-old would make an error on and we'll give it some more time? Or is this indica indicative of something deeper going on, perhaps with motor speech planning or some later difficulty with phonemic and phonological awareness? And so the speech pathologist will be able to answer those questions. Is this something I should be concerned about or should we wait and see? Yeah. And just thinking about such a wide range of skills that go into, you know, being um, processing language that you hear and also using words and sounds in order to express your ideas. The um, huge range of those skills and the range and complexity of those skills um, becomes really apparent, right? Because first we have to learn to make those sounds, then we have to learn to speak in words, then we have to learn to speak in sentences. It's, it's a really amazing process to see. Um, and so thinking of that giant range that um, a, a giant range of language skills that a child has to acquire, are there any clear sort of warning signs or moments that um, parents should, you know, that you would want to bring to the attention of a parent who has concerns about their child's speech language development? Sure. So in terms of speech language development, um, thinking again about much younger children, if the child is late to talk, late to put words together and late to express themselves, I would definitely want to get in touch with a speech therapist right away. Many children are late talkers who also will developmentally catch up, but a speech pathologist will be able to determine if that is the case or if further support is warranted. And that's a really important time to do this because we know that language is so important for language later success in school. So the earlier, the better. But I would really turn it around to parents and say, if you are getting feedback from the school or if you are concerned yourself about your child's academics, take a look at language. So often reading delay, difficulty with writing or challenges in math tend to be the first red flags that we see for a student as they enter school. Um, and often the, the solution is, well, let's support reading and let's support math. And that definitely is important and needs to happen. But there may be a language piece driving everything. If, if following directions is hard for a student, he or she is not going to be able to sequence the events of a story or lay out the events of a story problem in math. And so there may be another component. So I would say certainly oral language being an indicator, but also taking a look at the relationship with academics and language. And if you're concerned about academics, also take a look at language because that may be able to support all of the areas. Yeah, I think as, as a parent, it just becomes such a complex puzzle to try and tease apart. Um, because as you were discussing the idea of being able to follow those multi-step directions, I was also thinking of the way in which executive function skills can impact um, the way in which a child is able to you know, kind of store and process all of that information in order to be able to organize themselves to follow through without the impulsivity that might get in the way or the distractibility that might get in the way of, of follow through. Um, so would your recommendation be to begin with a neuropsych evaluation to try and understand what the issue is? Or do you think a consultation with a speech language pathologist that you know, if a parent has like a focused question um, or a focused concern, it it's because I know the neuropsych process can be very expensive mm -hmm. and um, it also is very time consuming. Um, so are, is there a way for a parent to um, identify if perhaps the language is specifically speech related in order to seek out the help of a speech language pathologist before consulting with the neuropsychologist? 
Absolutely. A neuropsych, a neuropsych eval is certainly fantastic. It is extremely comprehensive, but takes a long time and is very costly and can weigh a lot on the student as well to kind of sit through all of that testing. So I think consulting a first a speech language pathologist as a first step is really a fantastic idea. I work with a number of neuropsychologists who, after their testing, recommend follow-up speech and language assessment, and I often conduct speech and language testing based on those recommendations. Mm -hmm. uh, it's much shorter than a neuropsychological evaluation, and it will still give you a lot of information in terms of language functioning, and it could also help rule out language as an area of concern. As you said, Mara, perhaps it is executive functions that are uh, challenging the student in the classroom, a speech and language evaluation that may only take one to two hours could mm -hmm. maybe shine more light onto that and offer more information in a much quicker time frame. And then that information, if it's not done by the school, can certainly be shared with the school to immediately implement the supports. Yeah, it's, um, it's again, the puzzle piece of raising kids, the puzzle piece of language, the puzzle piece of processing. It's, it's, um, it's so complex that I feel like sometimes it can be hard to know where to begin. Um, but I think, you know, knowing how large a role speech language skills play in academic success and in um, not only acquiring those foundational learning and reading and language skills, but also um, being able to tackle far more complex ideas and texts and um, sitting through lectures and processing all of that language too. Um, having, having the expertise of a language expert uh, to be able to identify, you know, if, if it's a language-based issue or perhaps something else seems like a really valuable first step that, um, in my experience, often isn't the first recommendation that, um, schools will put out there. So I think that's that's a really valuable recommendation. Absolutely. As you said, it's it's often not the first recommendation. It's usually something more academic based, like a reading below grade level or, or math challenges, but it very often may be a component. So I would definitely encourage parents to advocate for speech and language, whether it's a screening or a full assessment at their school, um, to get that information. It can be really empowering. Yeah, well, thank you so much for giving us this really informative um, overview of what a speech language pathologist does and um, how these skills impact students in the classroom because it is a huge area for all of us as educators to keep in mind, um, as parents to keep in mind, and I think also as um, you know, just people working in schools because so many schools don't have a speech language pathologist on staff to mm -hmm. offer this um, insight. But I think that um, speech language pathologists have a huge amount to offer in terms of uh, being a complementary skill set or um, resource for for all of the work that kids have to do in school. Mm -hmm. um, so. Thank you for, for highlighting all of those things. I feel like it's a good reminder for me as well. <laughs> My pleasure. Happy to, ha happy to be here and thank you for having me. Thanks.